Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to A Day in the Neighborhood. Tonight, we will be talking about youth issues. We will be talking about where the youth are at today, their challenges, and their struggles. And for this show, we have Dante Corpus, a student leader with United Players, Lonnie Holmes, a community activist, and George Durand, a member of the Sheriff's Department who is the co-founder of the Healing Circle. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. you are <coughs> in Balboa High School. Yeah, I'm in Balboa High School. And you're involved with the United Players. United Players, yes. Players. You guys have done a lot of good work, and I hear so much about your organization Thank you. and the kind of positive impact you're having on the kids today. You're bringing kids out of the streets and making sure that they do not, do not get involved in gangs and so forth. So could you tell our people about United Players and what you're doing? Okay, well, um, United Players basically work with kids from the elementaries to grown men in penitentiaries. And at Balboa High School, um, I got a good solid 10 to 15 solid students. That's really about change. And we did a lot of work this year. Mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. get back to the community. We did, um, we actually had a talk show like this about violence, Great. and we got the youth's perspective on violence in their community. Right. And that went good. And uh, we do a lot of things at Balboa High School. We did a sock drive for the homeless, and uh, we did a clothes and toy drive for the uh, children of shelters. And you guys perform too, right? You dance, you sing, you have that kind of program? Um, we provide those services with the uh, junior high kids and elementary kids uh -huh. on 6th and Folsom. Wow. Yeah. So you you have an uh, um, office uh, in the Santa Market? Uh, we, actually or no? we actually share a uh, space with the Park and Rec on 6th and Folsom. Uh -huh. Right now we're currently working on getting our own um, youth center. Okay. Yeah. Great. Now tell me. How is it difficult for a kid today, the kid your age today? Is is this econo economy, is it making it difficult for kids to... I mean, it is. It's rough out here for them. And I'm sure all of us up here, we feel their pain. Right. I mean, a lot of them is coming from broken homes, and it's a lack of guidance for them. Right. And they have nothing but to turn to is the streets, their friends. Right. And it seems to me like... To do good is not the right thing to them. Like, it's now, good Lonnie to be a square. Holmes is a community activist and has works for the probation department, so he's got extended experience with working yeah. kids like you. Lonnie, could you tell us what your experience is from the standpoint of a community activist working in this field? Well, I mean, I think uh, what I try to do is to give back as much as possible. Um, one of the things that uh, I have seen, obviously, uh, in addition to the, all the violence that is occurring in and around the streets of uh, San Francisco, is that there are a uh, handful of individuals like uh, you know the panelists that we have here, Dante and George, mm -hmm. that are out there doing good work and trying to reach out. But one of the things that is lacking, obviously, is the uh, the, the support network that. Uh, could uh, reach out and kind of fill in some of the gaps with some of the youth that uh, that that need some assistance, that need some guidance, that need right. mentoring. Um, and so, and right now, presently with the budget situation going right. the way it is, right. there's over a 350 million dollar deficit we're looking at. You know, we're going to have some problems because some of the youth programs will be cut, uh, and then we need to really band together to see just exactly you know, how we can not only fill some of those gaps, but also make sure that we provide a safety network right. uh, for some of these wayward youth so that they will have some place to go and they won't end up in the juvenile justice system right. uh, or committing some heinous crime that will ultimately land them in the criminal justice system and being tried as adults. And so, I mean, there are, a very, uh, there are a lot of complex issues right. uh, and there's a veritable cornucopia, if you will, of issues that are out there. Uh, but again, I think that if all the like minds uh, come together and talk about, you know, various strategies and talk about how we can just do some of the basic things like making sure that kids are eating on a regular basis, making sure these kids are going to school on a regular basis, making sure that they have somebody to talk to when there's an issue or when there's a problem to the point where 
things don't escalate to the point where these kids want to pick up a gun and shoot somebody because, right. you know, that's a very, very big problem. In fact, um, these kids can get a gun before they can get a good meal. Well, right. you know, let me, speaking of guns, speaking of guns, we have George Durand. Uh, uh, first time I met George, I was invited to the Healing Circle. I just mm. found out tonight that he's actually working for the Sheriff's Department. But when I went to this Healing Circle, circle and saw all these women, uh, and a few men who are parents of um, kids who are homicide <coughs> victims. I was quite shocked, to, to, to say the least, that this, this, all of these people who are survivors of this homicide actually exist in the city of San Francisco. So, George, could you tell us, I mean, it's a great service you're providing. Could you tell us about the Healing Circle and why did you think about form it and so on and so forth? Well the healing circle really came out of a manifestation from the sheriff's department out at county jail number five RSVP resolve to stop the violence program mm. in our training with restorative justice a process that can enhance and fill the gap in the criminal justice system to restore the harm that's caused by crime it gives an opportunity for those who are impacted by crime to have a voice in the whole criminal justice process. Mm -hmm. It has been, I'd say within the last 12 years that victims who have been impacted by crime actually had a voice in the process. How many, when I went to, to your healing circle session one day, how many parents are involved in the healing, healing circle? On our role, we have about 250 that's families. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. And that's not even considering those families that haven't accessed the Healing Circle or any other mm -hmm. service once mm -hmm. they've experienced a loss of a loved one. Mm -hmm. the, so the, those 250 families represent like each family would have a kid who has been killed in, uh, in, in violence? Well, they represent that and there's one family that has lost four three sons and one daughter oh my God. to homicide. So hopefully, you know, we need to start the healing and then we could stop the killing. And not only does the healing circle, we meet twice a month, but we also go into San Quentin and do surrogate work with those individuals that have perpetrated homicide. So there's also a dialogue between the survivors and those who have perpetrated and the goal is to come out with strategies to prevent the violence from, stop, from starting in the first place. So the whole process in restorative justice is to bring the offender, the perpetrator, the survivors or victims, and the community together to have a dialogue to come up with strategies. Because without strategies, it's going to keep perpetuating itself. Now, how, how old are the kids who mm -hmm. have been killed uh, in, in your... There was the 18-month-old baby was oh the youngest uh -huh. up until, you know, maybe 40 or 50. So we're seeing mm -hmm. already this year there's been 23 that we have documented on paper. And how old are they? The age, it yes. varies from uh -huh. 18 to 25. That's I, very young. Oh, mm -hmm. of course it's young. Mm -hmm. The right. baby boomers got into the drug uh, epidemic, so mothers and fathers are not there. The prison complex has, you know, quadrupled right. since 10 years ago. So there's a lot of variables. And not only does the Healing Circle go into the prison and the jail, but we're also working with a transformative mentor program right. that's out of county jail number five. And we're also working with the men's breakfast that meets every fourth Sunday mm -hmm. because we're looking for men yeah, that exactly. are willing to take the risk to talk mm -hmm. to young people. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. I think young people are disconnected from our mm -hmm. society mm -hmm. in a way where people are frightened of them, right. mm -hmm. people don't understand them. So the best thing to do is they just leave them leave alone. Them so yeah, those yeah. kids are killed with the use of guns, right? Guns. Mm -hmm. Now let me, let me ask uh, Dante here, I remember Back in my old days, <laughs> when kids get mad at each other, they beat each other up. They just, you know, kick each other up, right? Uh, but they don't, do, they don't do that anymore, right? I remember no, reading an article, there's two kids got into some kind of argument at the Metro, mm -hmm. 14 and 15 year old. Next thing you know, they, they've never met each other before. Next thing you know, one kid just pull out a gun, 
pop the other kid. Yeah. Why is this? I mean, uh, talking about that incident. Yeah. The student actually went to Balboa. Oh my God. And uh, I was constantly talking to him every day, trying to provide services to him. But now if the kid, if he don't want the help, I can't force him to join the program. But I was always in his ear at lunch. I'd be in his ear. You know what I'm saying? Come join our program. Right, you know what right. I'm saying? You need somebody to talk to. He was a very, he had a lot of stuff inside. Yeah. And uh, the day that happened, that incident you was talking about, I guess he was just tired of everything and, you know what I'm saying? Just did what he did. And now he's, you know what I'm saying? Now he's, uh -huh. where's he at? He's locked up. He's locked up. How old is this kid? He was 15. 15 years yeah. old? It's hard for me to fathom why would a 15 year old, why are the parents of this 15 year old? I mean, I don't mean to speak on nobody's parents, but uh, I'm not sure, to tell you the truth. Um, because the average kid, uh, at least I know of, would, they would think twice. I mean, you know, my mom will get hurt, my brother, you know, I'll miss my parents, I have to go to school tomorrow, I have to, you know, have a future, I have to get a job, I would like to get yeah. married, yeah. have kids of my own, that things would be like a that. Lot. Yeah. That would be good in a, a realistic sense, but yeah. we have to stay in reality. Right. You know, I got to eat, I want to wear nice clothes, mm -hmm. I watch TV, I see people driving nice cars, they live in nice homes, and my parents are on drugs. Mm -hmm. So what am I going to do? So I'm going to nap, I'm going to gravitate to somebody that's in the same condition as I am. Yeah. So you got a lot of young people walking around with rage, a lot of hurt, a lot of anger, because they, they're disconnected. They, you know, it's no Ozzy and Harriet when you go home, if there's a home. So mm -hmm. you got a lot of children being raised by grandparents because the, the mothers are and fathers are either incarcerated or, or on drugs. So you got a lot of variables. So you got a lot of young people raising themselves. And then when you put, where am I gonna work? So I'm not gonna work, I can sell dope. That's the easiest way to go. So if there's no alternative, if, if the government or nobody else is coming in with different alternatives, what is the first thing that's gonna be cut? When this, with this budget crisis going on. A lot of the programs that, you know, at least give at least some semblance of help to some young people, not all young people are gonna go for it because a lot of smokescreen stuff, there's a lot of uh, CBO pimps that are really just, you know. CBO meeting what? Uh, Community-based organizations oh, okay. that are getting funds to facilitate things in the community, but not everybody's participating in that process. Not everybody's going to be able to, you know, seek that help because the people that really need the help, those agencies don't touch. They're afraid of them, wow. except yeah. the United players and a few other people that are going in the trenches where the action is, where, you know, ground zero, if you will. Now, Lonnie, you work in the probation department. How Correct. many kids go through the system? Um, if I remember it correctly, there about, there's about 3,000? Thereabouts. It fluctuates from year to year, 3,000 to 4,000. Um, but let me just say, I mean, this is a very complex issue. Uh, and I think that, you know, it's, 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 it's very difficult to kind of pinpoint, but it, it starts at home. Uh, and whatever home is, and home to a lot of youth or a variety of different things. Uh, but again, I think when these kids begin to start going to elementary school, for an example, we need to start looking at how we can provide the appropriate interventions during the elementary school level. Mm -hmm. Because what we're looking at is seeing generations of kids coming up into the game as they uh, classify it as. Uh, and so in order for them to survive, they have to be able to get a gun. They have to be able to do the things that are necessary so that no one, so they're not victimized essentially, you know. And so in, in, in many cases, they end up, be, you know, becoming uh, the perpetrator of a lot of crimes based on the fact that they don't want to be the victim. And so, um, you know, there are some, some embedded issues that are in a lot of the communities, particularly in our communities that have the highest crime and arrest rates. Now, that, what are the, ra is there like a racial composition that 
is there are there certain races that are more prevalent through in going through this juvenile the African American community? community is 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 certainly number one and then uh, and, and and if you look at you know uh, statewide it, it's pretty consistent and you also have the Latino community that, that is uh, right behind there and then. Uh, then you have others, you know, um, you know, Asian Pacific Islanders, right, obviously, right. And, and, and and so, you know, again, I mean, I think it also depends on the specific areas that you mm -hmm. are, and obviously, you know, when you look at a great city like San Francisco with the wealth that is generated here daily, um, you know, how is it that some of these kids are going without food? How is it that these kids are in a situation Every, everything where... Everything goes to the top, I guess. Well, well, yeah, but I mean, again, I mean, we have to also be realistic, too, right. because we, we essentially have, and this is happens across the country, where you have essentially two different cities all in one. Exactly. Uh, and so the, the gap is getting wider and wider, particularly exactly. with the, the housing crisis now that is hitting the city and uh, actually hitting the country. Um, you know, it, it's and the gas prices, everything is coming to a screeching halt. So I read in the examiner that, that big wigs in City Hall are getting their $37,000 raises, right? <laughs> well, it's you know, <coughs> 7 or $8 a gallon. Uh, in fact, in Europe, I believe it's like 10 or $11 a gallon, but it gets right. to the point when, you know, it's, it's unbearable and unacceptable, then I think that you'll see the masses stand up and say enough is enough. We need to have some systematic change. You know, a friend of mine, going back to Dante, a friend of mine was telling me, um, he's a vice principal in one of the elementary schools, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so anyway, he has this Vietnamese kid who's 17 years old, always in trouble. <coughs> he walked into his office and say, kid, you know, you do you want to end up dead? Do you want to be out in the street? Do you... What's wrong with you? So this kid stared at his vice principal and said, Hey man, how much money do you make a year, huh? He goes, I make in a week what you make in a year. And, you know, the vice principal was like shocked completely, you know, obviously. But. You said an elementary kid? Uh, this is a. Uh, yeah, I think grade six or something. I mean, back, it goes back to image. I mean, it's the media that's just pounding all yeah. those kids that you have to have. You know those designer shoes, the designer labels are cool, and if you're just getting something from Payless, you're not well, with a cool well, crowd you also or have something. To too that the the saturation of all this stuff, you know, whether it looks uh, ghetto fabulous as they say, uh, is not all what it's cracked up to be. Right. But these kids, you know, can very, you know, in many cases, cannot discern uh, reality from you know uh, what is actual fact, and so. You know, and what you have is that whole theory of crystallization where everybody's traveling the same ball. If you're not getting outside your community to see what else is out there by way of option, then that, <clears throat> that is the life, uh, the form of life that you begin to take on. And in many cases, you have kids who haven't even been out to the beach, okay, <laughs> 13 years old. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's a real travesty, but it's actually true. So these kids are trapped in their neighborhoods, and in many cases, some are trapped in their homes. Uh, and so we have to understand that in order for us to break that cycle, we have to go to where the issues are basically more prevalent. And that is, again, in those areas where you have the highest crime and arrest rates. Now, are they, uh, the, the kids who are victims uh, through uh, in this healing circle, are they mostly boys or girls? What's the... It just varies because uh, bullets don't have no... They don't discriminate. Right, right. That's there correct. Was, there was young ladies that got killed. There was, but mostly men, mostly young males, black and brown, are the ones that are really getting the the gamut of the homicide. Now, are they finding? Is the police department successful in finding the killers? In some regards, I think the distrust that many. Uh, indigenous communities have with the police from a lot of variable reasons yeah. that nobody's willing to step forward and then the snitch, for those right? yeah well snitch whatever yeah. people want to yeah, call right, it right, right. I think snitch is taken out of context but anyway so if if my community doesn't trust the police then we're not gonna tell them nothing and I think you know when you think about healing all of us need to be part of that process from law enforcement to the community to the survivors to the perpetrators until that happens it's going to be status quo 
Mm -hmm. We're not telling. Everybody's going to take the I don't snitch posture. But to be honest, a lot of people want to come forward and tell. But will they mm -hmm. be protected? Mm -hmm. yeah. You yeah. know, that's, yeah. that's another yeah. thing. How are you going to remove somebody out of the, a place that they grew up? All their family ties are there. And then you ship them off to another area where all their ties are here. Mm -hmm. Anybody with, with, with any scruples is going to want to see their family. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So are you going to move the whole family? No, we're just going to move a part of it. Well, they're going to keep coming back. And there's been several incidents in San Francisco where people were in the victim witness program. Right. They came back and got killed. Well, what would be alternative, though, to make, to make it work? The, I think uh, the, uh, the eyewitness program. The, the <coughs> alternative would be... Move the entire family to move the whole family or to open up the dialogue mm -hmm. where law enforcement and the community are talking about issues that are critical to the well-being of everybody. Public safety is the number one priority. In order for that to happen, we got to have a relationship. Right now, there's really no relationship between law enforcement and some of these people of color communities. Well, what yeah. do the kids think about the police officers, about law enforcement officers? Um. In the Ingleside Station, um, the new captain, um, Dennis O'Leary, yeah. uh, he seems to be well-liked. He w was in the South of the Market, right? I mean, it goes back to um, they don't want to be looked at as a snitch or even having a conversation with the police because if people see that on the streets, then basically they're already going to label that person as, oh, he's talking to the police. That's going to put their, you know what I'm saying, their life's in danger. It's just, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? A lot of people nowadays, they don't want to deal with the police. Mm -hmm. yeah. And see, part of it is not really having a propensity yeah. to, to be able to expand beyond what it is that you see or, or that you, you basically deal with on a regular basis in terms of just trying to survive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What we need is to have corporate America, uh, partnership with mm -hmm. our school district, start developing enclaves and OJTs with some of these youth at an early age, uh, start uh, skills developments and all these other kind of things. And so we can start looking at developing a workforce earlier because right now the uh, development of a workforce only is predicated on those individuals who go to college and, and subsequently look at trying to major in a you know, specific field of uh, uh, or career. You're uh, thinking of alternative education of some type? I, I'm, uh, it's not necessarily an alternative education. I think it's a necessary education. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, years ago when I was in school, you had metal shop, you had wood shop, you had mm -hmm. all okay. those kinds of things. And so we need to begin to look at developing and doing the school district actually needs to start developing more uh, individual transition plans for those individuals who aren't going to college so they can, you know, when they become a you know, sophomore or junior, then they can start looking at skills development within the schools. Uh, and that's one of the things that Arnold Schwarzenegger talked about. Uh, but the reality is, is that we, as soon as these kids, you know, uh, <coughs> develop a, s some self-worth, uh, then they realize that, hey, look, you know, I don't want, I don't need to be out here on the streets. I can go exactly. get a job in this area. I can go do that. I can do this just yeah. based on the skills that I've learned. And so we're not teaching these kids soon enough. Uh, and we are not looking at developing the type of skills that are going to be congruent with today's, you know, workforce. Okay, if you become a mayor today, how would you handle this problem? And by the way, you ran for mayor last time. <laughs> so, but how would you, how, what, would, what would be the first thing you will do? And then George, of course, you know, being actively involved, I want to see, like, what, what do you guys think? What would be the first step to, to solving this problem? Well, let me, let me just say this. My ideal, uh, emphatically, would be to uh, reach out to corporate America mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and say, corporate America, I need your help. These businesses to start <coughs> making sure that you know jobs and are developed, and that not only for youth but also for some of these families who uh, who do not have breadwinners, because a lot of we have a lot of unemployment. The unemployment in the African American community is extremely high, uh, and the Latino community is extremely high in many right. cases. And so, you know, again, we need to start thinking outside the box and start doing some looking at creative solutions uh, so that we can start bridging the gap because that is one of the key problems in terms of employment, the economic oppression that uh, that we're not, not not only here but across the country that many cities face. George, with the parents you 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 are dealing with, 
when their kids are killed, is there like a wake up call? Do they go through this process of thinking? To not allow their loved one's life to go in vain, to speak up for them, to keep their memory in the front of the dominant culture. Do they say something like, oh my God, if I had only done something else, if I done this differently, and if there's other siblings that they would like over extend themselves to do something completely different than the way they raised the first one or something like that, I guess. That comes up automatically. Right. Whether your child is, if your child was killed by homicide or not, if yeah. your child was going to school and the principal call you, yeah, right. that's just a natural phenomena that parents go through. Right. So that goes on as well, but you know, if you start the healing, mm -hmm. I have never seen no economic program to try to deal with the issues that are we're plagued with today. Why are young people selling dope? Exactly. And hey, you, you look up to teachers, and a lot of kids do, but and many of them know they go out here and look up to some folks that's out here doing something <laughs> they shouldn't be doing. Yeah. And so again, I mean, we, 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 have to change, we have to change that culture some kind of way, and, and the only way we're gonna do that is look at channeling the resources and putting the resources in uh, to where it is. And the private sector has to come in. There's no other way to look at it. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. It's, it's always an enlightening experience talking to community leaders who spend day in and day out trying to make a difference in our communities. Um, I will be filming uh, a show, I think, in San Quentin, and with, you, with your group, you'll be performing there, and I'm looking forward to that, and you know, hopefully I'll bring them that as part of this show. But anyway, thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you so you. much. Okay. Thank you so much. And, Good seeing you again. Good night.